Hello, no mic. when she does it. You know, just be aware that I don't need to talk as much. Yeah. You, you want to, after she's done? Yeah, after she's done. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. but I'm sure you have the first. Yeah. But you know, no scan never responds. <laughs> and the host rarely responds. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. I think you get it, but she with you. No. She always responds. She always does. Yeah. She's on it. Yeah. Good evening. It is now six o'clock, and I'll call the meeting to order. Uh, clerk, please do the roll call. Mayor Frederick? Here. Deputy Mayor Winkler? Here. Councilmember Ballard? Here. Councilmember Elliott? Here. Councilmember Vassa? Here. Councilmember Gasick? Here. Councilmember Wargo? Here. And Councilmember Walton <laughs> is absent. I haven't, have you, did she email you, Keith? Yeah. Oh, she did. Okay. Council, uh, Deputy Mayor Winkler? I um, make a motion that we excuse <laughs> Councilmember Walton from this meeting. Councilmember Bassa? I second. Any discussion? Oh. Councilmember Elliott? No, I was. No discussion? Okay. Uh, I'll call for the vote then. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Thank you. Please stand and join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. To the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. First, we have a time for public comments this evening. Uh, clerk, has anyone uh, called in or written in? No, there's and there's no one online. Okay. Uh, is there anyone in the audience that would like to speak? Okay. Uh, seeing none, we'll move on to the approval of the agenda. Do we have a motion? 
Deputy Mayor Winkler. I move we approve the agenda. Council Member Elliott. I second that. Any discussion? Seeing none, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? The agenda is approved. Okay, first on our presentations tonight, we have uh, 28th District Representative Mari Levitt. And uh, we all know that she's done incredible work for the city of DuPont. We're so very grateful. But uh, she's here tonight to uh, give us an update on uh, what happened with this in the legislature this spring. So Mari, the floor is yours. You have to turn that on there. Turn. Okay, I'm teachable, that's good. <laughs> so th thank you, Mayor and Council Members. It's great to be with you and it's an honor to, to be before you and, and to have great partners in you all and, and um, have you active partners in the Association of Washington Cities um, to make sure that we're doing good things for our cities and towns and the state. So um, with that, um, there are, are many topics that I could cover tonight um, and um, I don't have enough time to do that. So I'll try to do some highlights that I think are of interest to the citizens of DuPont um, and you all. And then if I don't cover everything, I'm all, all happy to answer any questions that you may have and then also can do any follow-up. So okay. um, with that, I'm gonna put my reading glasses on because that's how I am these days. So there you go. Um, so um, a couple things just want to mention. So we just came off of our 60-day session, which is a supplemental budget session. Um, it's the less robust budget of the year. Um, and I'm going to look up to the council member on the screen as well. Um, uh, but having said that, it was a very busy and robust 60-day um, short session. Um, again, it's a supplemental budget for both capital, transportation, and operating um, which means that there's less dollars available to invest in, in good things. Um, but I think the dollars that we did have, we invested in some good things. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about that. Um, just some stats, because I almost was a math major. Wasn't, but almost was. Um, and I like stats still. Um, there were 373 bills that were signed um, and that got across the finish line. And I often say that um, bills are meant to fail. They're not meant to succeed. And so there were over 1,100 or 1,100 plus bills that were introduced, and again, 373 that were um, signed by the governor. Um, the one thing I will say, the session is done. Um, so the governor has signed all bills that he's going to sign. He's vetoed any line items or any bills that he's going to veto. Um, so we are done with um, the session, which is very exciting to be in that state. So 393 bill or 373 bills, as I mentioned, um, passed across the finish line. 297 of those um, had 80% strong bipartisan support, um, so um, which is a, a significant feat. And then 236 passed unanimously. So I think it's worth noting uh, that oftentimes folks in you think of Washington D.C., which we're not, um, but there's, you know, you don't get things done and um, you're, you certainly don't work in a bipartisan way. That's not the case in Washington state. So you should take stock in that. Um, there were several um, issues that I'm going to talk about tonight, but before I get there, I just want to share a little bit about the um, committees that I serve on um, and have a focus on, and that is capital budget, um, which is all things housing, education, um, and infrastructure. I love infrastructure. Um, so I'm a big fan of, of all things infrastructure. Um, I serve as vice chair of the housing committee, co-chair of the joint committee on military and veterans affairs, and then also serve on the um, higher education um, committee, which is what we call post-secondary education and workforce development, um, and then some other ancillary committees as well. Um, so I'm going to highlight um, some topics that we heard that were important to constituents um, of DuPont. Um, and beyond, and that includes public safety and community safety, behavioral health. I know Councilmember Ballard cares much about that, um, veterans and military affairs. Um, so I've always known that um, the 28th had a lot of veterans um, in our um, district. Um, and and, and um, anecdotally, I thought that we were number one in terms of serving the most veterans, um, but the latest census data has declared that. So I'm very proud to say um, that the 28th is the number one officially um, for serving the most veterans um, and military families. So that's exciting. I also want to talk a little bit about, I mentioned housing and homelessness, a little bit about education, 
And when I talk about education, I'm talking about early learning to post-secondary education. Um, so the broad swath of what education um, looks like. And then, um, of course, um, workforce, which um, pick a field and you know that we have workforce challenges. So um, we'll go from there. Um, a couple of things I want to mention first, um, which I know are of city interest. Um, and um, first, I will say that we did not raid your public works account. So you should be very proud, <laughs> very happy that we didn't raid it. Um, in that regard. So the public works account is held whole. Um, also, we have grants available um, for House Bill 1012, which is the Extreme Weather Protection Act. So grants will be available to cities, towns, and um, local junior districts, as well as um, other jurisdictions um, administered by the Department of Military Affairs um, for extreme weather events, um, which we know will continue. Um, and those are for times of um, when it's um, super cold, super hot, and then in times of poor air quality um, and their pets. Um, so we wanna make, make sure that we're protecting our, our citizens and you will have opportunity to explore those grants. Um, we also have 4 million of clean energy um, audits and grants for clean energy buildings. We require you to have clean energy buildings, um, but we haven't always um, given you dollars. So now we have dollars for that, which I think is also important. Um, 62 million for backfilling um, local document recording fees. This is especially important for our renters. We have in the 28th, you may not know, but 47% are renters. Um, and um, you know many are rent overburdened. And what rent overburden means is that they're paying more than 30% of their income towards rent. Um, so backfilling the document recording fees, dollars, was very important. We heard from Pierce County and we heard from other um, jurisdictions across the state. And it also covers um, utility assistance. So it's not just for rental assistance, but it's for utility assistance as well. So 62 million for that. Um, we eliminated um, the basic law enforcement training, 25% local government match or requirement. Um, and I saw Chief Newman earlier and he may, oh, there he is, there he is. Okay. Um, so if Chief Newman were to hire a new law enforcement officer, which I hope he does, um, then he won't need to pay for that additional 25%. And so this is not just only important for DuPont, but it's really important for basic law enforcement training um, coverage across the state. Um, and that's a big deal, and it's about $8 million. Um, we provided cities um, with um, liability protections for first responders, um, which is also important in 2208 um, for first responders, mobile health crisis um, folks as well. We know that you're operating in good faith, and we want you to have those protections, so that, that was included. Um, we also did $2 million for local grant dollars for our public health departments to do prevention, education, and awareness. Um, and then Tacoma Pierce County Health Department will get $750,000 to develop a toolkit that will be shared by um, our um, local health department to other local health departments so they don't need to reinvent the wheel in terms of how they do prevention, education, and awareness on opiate and fentanyl. Um, I mentioned House Bill 2088. We also um, provided, which I think is important to um, our part-time law enforcement folks who want to participate as a law enforcement officer, but perhaps they can't um, participate in a full-time way, but they have left improvement benefits. Um, so that's another incentive for them to be able to participate as a law enforcement officer that they can be part-time, but also get law enforcement benefits. Um, so that's on the city, um, I think, of interest um, campaign. On housing and homelessness, um, I think it's worth mentioning, I already mentioned the backfill of document recording fees, which is also important, but we infused $127 million in the Housing Trust Fund. To give you context, the Housing Trust Fund has built approximately 65,000 units since 1986, which is the year I graduated from Lincoln High School at Tacoma, <laughs> so I'll mention that. Um, but so 65,000, we needed a million homes um, by 2040. So um, it's really important that we continue to invest in the housing trust fund to continue to do that. And half of those homes need to be affordable. Um, so that's really important. Um, House Bill 1929 created um, um, an impact on housing programs, which also is very important for young adults and those who are experiencing are leaving um, inpatient um, treatment and they need housing. And so we wanna make sure that we're providing that opportunity 
House Bill 1892, which I sponsored, is the Workforce Housing Accelerator Program um, for 50 to 80 percent AMI that allows private developers, nonprofits, and others to have a workforce housing uh, revolving loan fund. And we'll continue. You'll see some action in 2025 on our self help development funds and think self help development of Habitat for Humanity and things like that. Um, but this requires um, folks to pay the dollars back. So it's a revolving low fund that will continue to go in affordable housing, um, which had broad support from realtors to low-income housing alike. Um, House Bill 1998 talks about co-living um, housing. So think um, a, a room in, a, in an area that has shared living. Um, for those um, folks that make sense, that's a good opportunity. Um, we also did um, strengthen opportunities for purchase of mobile home parks um, in House or Senate Bill 6059, um, Senate Bill 6013, expanded home ownership property tax exemption to include self-help housing, again, that we've talked about. And then we infused $150 million in low and moderate clean energy assistance and $19 million in um, our most vulnerable housing population and home ownership, um, which we know there's a wealth gap. Um, across the board, and we want to continue to build home ownership in our in our uh, community and in the residents of DuPont and beyond. Um, I know that the city of DuPont cares deeply and uh, about public and community safety. So, in addition to what I mentioned earlier of infusing dollars to our part time um, folks to get left benefits to to um, provide incentive to work as a, a law enforcement officer and the. 25%, $8 million BLAT, our basic law enforcement training um, expansion. And then we've also expanded um, training in the um, CJTC, which is the Criminal Justice Training Center. Uh, we have a lot of acronyms in the legislature, and I know you do in AWC as well. Um, but so I'll try to spell those out. But if I don't, please correct me and, and, and flag that for me. Um, but we have invested so many... Um, um, basic law enforcement training academy classes that the criminal justice um, training center has said, please stop. We can't take you. We can't take it anymore. We, we've, you've invested so many that we can't provide the services that you're asking us to provide. So we're very excited to have the regional training centers, both in Yakima and Vancouver and Skagit. I'm going to, I went to the grand opening of the, um, the Tri-Cities, um, um, regional training center. I'm going to the gra graduation ceremony in May for the Vancouver Center. Um, you'll see up north. Um, but we're providing opportunities so folks don't have to leave their family, um, particularly on the east side. If you're a law enforcement officer or you want to be a law enforcement officer, it's really cumbersome to have to leave your family, go to Burien for many weeks, do the training, and then come back. And so we're continuing to invest um, in that. So on the public safety side, in addition to what I've already mentioned House Bill 1214 protects our election workers. If you have been in Pierce County, which I know you are, um, you will know that um, there was an envelope that included fentanyl um, into our um, into the Pierce County election office, and that was not unique. Uh, there were six um, election um, worker offices across the state um, that several had um, fentanyl included in the envelope. Some others had. Um, other substances that wasn't fentanyl with the intent to um, disrupt our elections office. So we want to protect our election workers who really are the unsung heroes of democracy. Um, we have provided a, a trooper longevity bonus. So if you have worked as a Washington state trooper, which is the jurisdiction that the state as a legislature has control over or authority over, if you will, not control, but authority, um, we've extended that longevity bonus. So if they want to continue to work, we want them to work and we'll give them a bonus to do so. Um, House Bill 2013 is a first responder and wellness program expansion. I know Chief Newman is well aware of this particular bill, as are others really important to continue to, to talk about our first responders and wellness programs. Senate Bill 6006 is an omnibus trafficking bill. There were three bills rolled into one. I serve on the Washington Task Force of Trafficking Against um, human persons. It's an odd title, but anyway, uh, but it focuses on trafficking. We have law enforcement, we have providers and others. And so that was a really important bill. House Bill 1961 addresses animal cruelty and the criminal penalties. We know that if you um, are more likely to um, affect an animal, you have potential to affect a human. Um, and that's really important. Um, House Bill 2048 strengthens domestic violence protection and support 
supervision requirements. House Bill 1919 expands criminal offenses involved in AI um, for sexually explicit fabricated images of minors. Um, that occurred up in Lake Washington um, for students um, who were going to a prom. Um, it's occurred in others. And so um, AI um, can be very exciting and have great um, robust positive impacts, but it also can be um, very negative um, towards, ne towards our minors. And so this protects our minors from fabricated images. Um, we adopted initiative 2113, which is vehicle um, pursuits. I know that's something that's been important to the city of DuPont. Um, and so expanded the opportunity and the flexibility for vehicular pursuits. Um, school bus trespass um, penalties has been, um, sent, it was a Senate bill, 5891. Um, it turns out that um, if you, um, I'm a mom with three kids in public schools. So when you go in public schools, you have to show your ID or you have to show your face, and you have to explain why you're there. And, you know, there's a lot of protocol. Um, but what we found out, that there's no protocol on school buses. Um, so anyone could have just jumped on a school bus. Um, and unfortunately, in the Tri-Cities, someone did jump on a school bus um, and kill the bus driver. Um, and so that bill is named after the bus driver, but it e equalizes, if you will, um, school buses to school facilities um, and expands, expands that. Um, Senate Bill 5931 expands criminal penalties um, to, or sorry, um, House Bill 2153, um, expands criminal penalties to deter catalytic converter theft. Catalytic converter theft, fortunately, has gone down in 2023 from 2022. Um, but we want to make sure that those who are doing that activity have, um, um, I call compassion with accountability. <laughs> so um, they have accountability and they expanded the criminal penalties for that. Um, and then in addition, $5 million to um, increase victims' crime compensation benefits, $8 million for the criminal justice training and BLAT, I already mentioned, and then $2.7 million to backfill the burn JAG. If you're not familiar with burn JAG, um, those are the folks who have the drug trafficking task forces. I know Chief Newman will know about what that is. Um, and um, those dollars were diverted in 2023, so we've made those whole again, um, which I think is a very important investment. Um, on the behavioral health side, um, again, quite a bit um, that has been done. House Bill 1946 continues education and scholarships to entice behavioral health workers. We have a shortage of behavioral health workers, so we want to continue to do that. We also invested um, a significant amount of dollars in behavioral health of $230 million. $26 million was for rates for long-term community and civil commitments, $25 million for diversion and outpatient care, $35 million for behavioral health, personal care, um, and exceptional um, needs. And then $144 million for incapacitated improvements to inclusion of community capacity grants, which is really important for our community. Um, we also invested, you may have heard, um, there was a, a hospital in Tukwila um, that was closed. It was a behavioral health hospital, and the state purchased that to um, invest in more beds, which is really important. We know we need that. And so um, that also was there. Um, and then we also ingested benefits um, for our um, rates. We invested 7% in 2022, 2023, another 15% for capacity for our behavioral health providers. But these are for community health providers, which are important. But we also need to do and continue to do more, more work in 2025 for our private providers as well to increase the Medicaid rates because they're woefully low. Um, so I want to talk about opiate and fentanyl um, because it has been, I'm grateful to um, Chief Newman and the city of DuPont who pulled together a opiate uh, and fentanyl um, events. I don't know what, what was officially called, uh, but this was a, a significant focus for a 60 day session. And we invested 250 million um, for opiate and fentanyl um, crisis across our state in terms of investments, and then $35 million in the capital, so about $250 million um, focusing on addressing um, opiate and fentanyl crisis, whether it's um, $35 million in um, the capital budget for our tribal partners and our tribal facilities, which, by the way, serve 20% of tribal members and 80% of non-tribal members. So that's really important to note um, our tribal um, partners have been hit especially hard. There were many deaths in a two-week period up in the Lummi tribe um, and many others. And so $35 million 
um, for capital facilities and capital investments will go a long way towards serving non-Native members, 80%, um, and again, 20% are, are that. Um, in addition, we have focused on expanding the lock zone and Narcan across our school districts. In the past, we had a requirement that students um, in schools over 2,000 had Narcan and naloxone kits, but those under 2,000 didn't. Well, we know that kids are dying um, under 2,000 as well. And so now we have a requirement that all schools, um, regardless of size, will have that. We have a requirement now, and we funded it. So when I say requirement, we're funding all of these. Um, all of our public libraries will now have the Loxone and Narcan kits because we know that the public frequents libraries, um, which is really important. Um, a few bills I want to mention, House Bill 1956, also called the Lucas Petty Act. Lucas Petty was a student in the Silicon DuPont School District. Um, he died October 31st, 2022, um, from using marijuana laced with fentanyl. And um, so this will require our school districts to do an education awareness prevention campaign, in addition to having naloxone um, and updating the health standards. House Bill 2112 um, is the higher education um, I hesitate to say a companion. It's not a true companion in a, in a legislative word and verbiage, um, but it does require all institutions of higher education, private or public, community college, two-year, four-year, rural, rural or urban, um, to make sure that they are providing naloxone, they're providing education and prevention, and then, and then colleges were providing fentanyl strips. Fentanyl strips don't work if you're testing part of it. It shows no fentanyl, and another part may have fentanyl, but it's a process. I mean, it's the beginning of doing that. Um, House Bill 1635 um, provides police dogs. Believe it or not, there's only one police dog who can detect fentanyl. Um, and so we're expanding that to make sure that our police dogs and our um, police authorities have opportunities to train our dogs to detect fentanyl. Fentanyl 1877 um, has behavioral health investments in the system and better coordination with our tribes. 2075 requires Department of Health to quickly issue licenses. Um, we all know our state agencies are slow. <laughs> I'll just say that. Um, and they don't always provide um, helpful information. Um, and so um, bureaucratically, they can be a barrier. And so we're requiring Department of Health to quickly um, provide licensing for our tribal facilities uh, to be able to do that. Again, our tribal facilities are providing 80% of non-tribal folks. But in addition, they get higher Medicaid rates, which is good um, for everyone. So we want to continue to do that. Um, House Senate Bill 5804, I mentioned the locks in the schools. Senate Bill 1699 provides a tribal account um, that 20% of the opiate settlement dollars will go into that. Um, again, our tribal partners have hit, have and our brown and black communities have been hit exceptionally hard um, from opiate and fentanyl use. And so it's really important that we continue to support that. Um, and then some dollars investments, 156 million, um, access to opiate use treatment and disorder programs, 16 million for supporting families and supplies um, a, and child safety, another um, 16 million for public health awareness and outreach, and then naloxone, which I've already mentioned. Um, just a few more things, workforce. Um, our, we, our military spouses in particular struggle to get to work. We want them to get to work. They want to get to work. One in five Washington military families are food insecure. That's not a number that I have picked. It's a number that our military families um, and our military partners have identified. And so we identified three compacts this year that have all been signed by the governor. That's the physical, the physical um, assistance, um, physician's assistance compact, the social work compacts, and the um, teacher mobility con compact. And so these will all get our um, military spouses to work. We also have Native American apprenticeship programs. Our Native Americans have been the lowest in apprenticeship um, participants. So we've done that. We've invested in Running Start. Um, so if, if Council Member Walton were here, she would appreciate that. Or maybe not, <laughs> because the dollars are being taken away from the school districts. But nevertheless. But for summer, it allows sophomores to participate in online um, Running Start kind of opportunities. We've expanded apprenticeship programs in our Department of Corrections. 95% of those who are incarcerated are released, and we want them to have skills and be contributing taxpayers when they're released and also reduce recidivism and increase public safety. And so we've done that. And then in addition, um, we've expanded our working connections um, opportunities in childcare. 
Um, Childcare is a huge barrier. And so we've expanded working connections opportunities for, for, for our students to be able to quickly um, get to work after their training because they have childcare options. Um, and then lastly, I'll mention um, education. We invested 335 million in, in education. Special education went from 13.5 to 16%. Sounds like a little, but we're about two thirds away there. Um, we're about one third shy. Um, we have been negligent for a very long time. I said that last year, I will continue to say that this year. We're getting closer though, um, and so that's good. Um, we expanded the prototypical school staff model of 72 million, materials and supplies and operating 44 million. Um, we expanded our um, a, our effort towards getting to universal school meals. When kids are hungry, they can't think. When I'm hungry, I can't think. <laughs> um, and so it's really important that our children um, have opportunity. Um, and then just a few other things I wanna highlight. Um, we have 13 million towards economic development in our small business grants um, and small business opportunities. We love our small businesses and we want them to thrive and we need to continue to do everything we can to do so. We had a bill introduced this year and last year that would give them a personal um, tax exemption. Um, it didn't quite get over the finish line. Our assessors are, um, are a little bit low in, on the low end of what I think they should be in terms of that, but we will continue to work with them and get that across the finish line. And then $8 million for digital equity and broadband. We know we need to continue to focus on broadband. We have been especially concerned that the broadband benefit program at the federal level stopped. And so many of the residents of DuPont and across Pierce County, across the 28th, have lost ability to get dollars to pay for their broadband access, which is digital equity. And so we need to continue um, to do that. Um, and then 1985 um, for our PERS 1 and PERS 2 folks, um, they um, are our older public retirees, say that, um, but um, they, they got another COLA um, this year. And then on our military and veterans front, um, I will just say that we invested heavily in our National Guard. I love our National Guard. I'm so grateful to be in the 28th. Um, and so the National Guard um, received both educational assistance benefits expansion in terms of making sure that their their spouses and dependents can have that, um, but then the, also the dollars. But we also did a recruitment bonus. We want to um, recruit and retain our National Guard members. This year we did the recruitment. I had a bill that had recruitment and retention. We got recruitment. So next year we're coming back with retention. Um, but we also expanded the definition of what a veteran is in terms of benefits. We expanded the opportunity for our um, our veterans to be able to register quickly uh, for post-secondary education. Um, and we also provided a tax exemption in House Bill 1862 to be able to provide um, for those nonprofits, they get a B&O tax exemption to serve our disabled veterans. And then our disabled veterans get a sales tax exemption. If you're in our district, which I know you all are, um, think um, JBLM and um, American Lake Golf Course. Um, and that will benefit certainly them, um, and then certainly any other districts across the state, Spokane and others who may have um, kind of similar facilities. So that's just a few highlights, <laughs> um, Mayor. Um, on the legislative front, there certainly are more, but I tried to, to highlight, I think, what will be important to DuPont. And then I'll just say on healthcare, you know, we, we did an insulin cap at $35, which is important because I, I we have many family members. But this year, we also have continued to focus on healthcare in terms of um, inhalers. Many of our children have asthma. Um, and we know with climate change and, and other, um, you know, um, poor quality, air quality issues, um, that's an issue. And then also EpiPens um, continue to reduce those costs. And then transparency, um, you know, our insurance is going up for healthcare. And so we have a transparency board across that will allow citizens and residents to be able to compare um, in real time, what that may look like to be able to make some wise choices. So with that, I'm grateful to be a partnership um, with you all. Um, I didn't mention the capital projects and transportation, which I will real quickly of 10.5 million for um, transportation for sidewalk safety in Spanaway. Um, I know you all don't live in Spanaway, um, but that's a big deal for them. Um, many dollars in the town of Silicon, you know, 855,000 for PFOS here, and another 1.9 million for PFOS in Lakewood. This is continuing on the PFOS effort. I mentioned I love infrastructure and PFOS is part of that. So I think we're upwards of 16 million about that. 
um, point for PFOS. Um, and then um, Graves Concern, Disability, Inclusive Playground, and in, in UP, which will be a regional asset because there is no inclusive playground in Pierce County, period. Um, so I invite you to come out to the groundbreaking on, on Friday at 11 a.m. Um, but several projects that were funded by the capital projects as well um, that I'm proud to have advocated for. So with that, I turn it over to you, Mayor. Thank you. That's uh, that's a lot in a short session. I know it's just the tip of the iceberg, right? <laughs> but yes. thank you for that summary. Uh, we might have a few council member questions. Uh, Deputy Mayor Winkler, go ahead. I just want to personally thank you for for several things. And I'll start with the PFOS. We we communicated quite a bit throughout the session on that. And I think it's important for everyone to realize whether they're here now or, or listening, it would not have happened without you. So on behalf of all the citizens of DuPont, thank you for making that happen. The other thing I want to commend you on is uh, you always reply. It's very interesting, um, and I won't name names, but when you're talking to other AWC um, attendees, they ask, how often does your rep reply? And I go, all the time. Mm -hmm. Some of those email replies are at 2.30 a.m. It might be a phone call at 8.35 in the morning, but you always reply. And I just personally wanted to thank you for doing that. And in addition, you fit us in for office visits. So thanks for what you do in representing us and taking time to hearing our concerns. Thank you. Council Member Elliott. I'm just going to echo what Mike said, but we have a stellar representative, and Mari, you are it. You have just gone to bat for DuPont. You've gone to bat for Pierce County, and we are so fortunate to have you. You've just done an excellent job, so thank you. And I agree with Mike. You do respond at any time, because I've gotten phone calls at 10 in the morning when I'm driving or at 10 o'clock at night. So thank you so much for all the hard work that you do for all of our citizens. Well, Representative Levitt, I think you can see that everyone recognizes that you're the representative to go through to get things done in Olympia. And um, not only do you get things done for the city of DuPont, but for the 28th district, for the state, and for our veterans. And for that, uh, we really appreciate your efforts. So thank you very much. Thank you. At this time, we have the um, DuPont Historical Society annual presentation. And uh, to give that presentation, we have our longtime volunteer, uh, Carol Estep, who's also a former citizen of the year here. So uh, Carol, the uh, floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Mayor Frederick, City Council and City staff. Um, I'm here this evening to give you a brief overview of uh, happenings in the museum and the Historical Society for 2023. Um, the photo that you see up on the screen is our new logo for the Historical Society. Um, this was designed for us by Alan Archambault, who um, at one time was the director and the curator for the Fort Lewis Museum. Next slide, please. So a little bit about some of our activities and a couple of um, statistics for you. Um, the museum last year had uh, 1,042 visitors. This is up from 2022, but it still isn't up to what we were at in 2019 uh, before we got closed down by COVID. Uh, we're off to a pretty good start for 2024, so we have high hopes that it'll continue through the summer and we'll have a higher visitorship this year also. The um, Historical Society values our members and our volunteers. Um, last year, we had a total uh, donated hours by the volunteers of 1,835. If you had to pay each of us $25 an hour, that would cost you quite a bit of money. So um, the volunteers uh, volunteer in the museum and they also uh, volunteer for events and programs. Um, next slide, please. 
Uh, some of our major events, our Cherry Blossom Tea is our main fundraiser every spring. Uh, last year, we held it out at the home course with 93 visitors, and uh, we brought in about $3,000. Um, our Historic Village Walk is kind of a fun event that we do every May. Um, this year's uh, event is going to take place on May 11th. Um, it's open to the public. It's free. Uh, just meet us at the museum at about 10 o'clock. We cover about a mile and a half. We touch on all of the history and historic village that we can think of. And depending upon how many visitors or how many walkers we have with us, how many questions, it takes us about um, 90 minutes. So it may not be considered it a walk. It may be considered more of an amble through the city of or the historic village of DuPont, but it's really kind of fun and we have a good time doing it. Um, do dress for the weather because we do it if whether or not the sun's shining or whether it's raining. Um, Lafbon High School reunion. Um, actually, this was an all school reunion. Uh, last year was the 50th anniversary of the um, last graduating class out of Lofbond, and it was the year that the Lofbond High School here in DuPont got closed down. Um, we decided to have a, um, a reunion for anybody who had attended school here in DuPont. We had about 200 people come out. They all seemed to have a really good time. And we've had people ask us if we could please do the reunion again in two or three years. So that's on our list to um, think about doing probably in another couple of years. The 4th of July pancake breakfast is one that the Historical Society has hosted for, I would say, upwards of 20 years. It's part of the city's um, 4th of July celebration. Um, we um, hold it in Clock Tower Park. We start serving our volunteers breakfast at 7.15. We open it up to the public at eight. And uh, this is one of the events that we can really use volunteers for. So if anybody is interested in coming out and helping us with it, um, just give us a, a phone call at the museum or send us an email. And then the 1843 Fort Site Walks, which are held at the Fort Site right across the street, uh, take place when we have the Hudson Bay uh, days down at uh, Clock Tower Park along with the barbecue uh, event. Um, last year, we had a total of 35 people take um, um, come with us on the walks. We also, we do a walk of the historic um, fort site, and then we also take in the uh, reburial site that's connected with the fort site. Um, Hudson's Bay Day this year is going to be held at, at the Clock Tower Park on April 24th and 25th. The um, Historical Society and Museum will be there on Sunday, um, August 25th. Spooky Stories. Spooky Stories was a new event last year. We held it in Clock Tower Park on um, a Friday evening, just as it was getting dark. We held it under the big tent in the in the um, Clock Tower Park. Our uh, storyteller was Chris Stottinger from the Pretty Gritty Tours out of uh, Tacoma. Uh, we're probably going to hold it again this year, probably on September 13th, which is a Friday, which should help with the sp spooky stories. And Chris Stottinger will probably be our storyteller again. A few... Um, a few other events that we did last year that were uh, maybe a little bit smaller in size was the Old Time Fiddlers in uh, Robinson Park. The Buffalo Soldiers were brought back to Buffalo or uh, to uh, Robinson Park. Uh, we had two book talks, one by historian Steve Anderson and one by retired Colonel Mike Kortz. Um, Mike Quartz is going to come back and give us another book talk on April 24th this year at 6.30 in the museum. And it's going to be on his second book, uh, Letters from Baghdad, Herding Cats. 
all of these events are open uh, to the public and free at no cost. Next slide, please. So um, the Historical Society was awarded several grants last year. The largest grant we was, were awarded was a $10,000 grant. It was um, a Working Washington Re Recuperation COVID grant, which was a federal grant that was admitted, administered through the state. Um, and then uh, as it worked its way down, it was actually Arts WA that administered it to us. This uh, grant was for operating expenses only, and it had to be spent in, in um, six months. Um, if anybody's interested in how we spent this for the museum and for the Historical Society, just drop us an email and I'll be happy to send you a list of what we spent it on. Then we partnered with Parks and Recreation for a $5,000 Puyallup Tribe Charitable Trust Grant. This grant was for cultural programming. We paid for the Hawaiian dancers at the farmer's market last summer. We did some signage on the Kanakas who worked at Fort Nisqually. And this grant uh, uh, carried over into 2024. So in February of 2024, we sponsored the showing of the Buffalo Soldier film, uh, Buffalo Soldiers Fighting on Two Fronts. We also received a $2,000 Nisqually Tribal Charitable, Charitable Tribal Grant from the uh, Nisqually Tribe. And this went to um, updating and improving the exhibit in the back room of the, of the museum on Northwest Landing. Uh, and then we had two LTAC grants through the city. One was for the Buffalo Soldiers and one was to help pay for expenses at, at the Hudson Bay event. Um, next, you can go to the next slide, please. So most of you know um, that the museum is housed in the old meat market that was here for when the DuPont company was here. 1909 to 1976. Um, the museum has needed some maintenance done on it for a couple of years. Uh, last year, the city received a Pierce County Preservation Grant to fix some dry rot on the front of the building. And this year, we would like to thank you for setting aside the ARPA funds to do some maintenance on the building. Uh, we had an email from Jason Williams that said we're going to get, or we're not going to get, the building is going to get a new paint job uh, next Monday and Tuesday. So um, we're really excited about that, and it should help um, preserve the building and um, also help to make it look nicer. So that kind of takes us into 2024. I just have two uh, projects that the Historical Society and the museum have going. One of them is um, the narrow gauge train that sits behind the museum. Um, the boxcar for that train has needed some work done on it for a number of years. It's um, really, it's falling apart. And so we have determined that we are going to raise the money and have it restored this year. Um, we uh, have a bid to, to for the restoration on the boxcar. It's about $48,000. By the time we probably pick up a few extra little costs that will come along with it, it's probably about $50,000 that we're going to need to take care of the restoration. We have a company out of Arlington, Washington, uh, the Historic Railway, Railway Preservation Company that's going to do the work for us. They're going to come down, pick up the boxcar, put it on a flatbed truck, take it back up to Arlington to their place of business. They do uh, restoring of uh, railway cars on a regular basis. Um, they feel that it'll take them about three months so uh, right now we're scheduled to have them come get the, the 
boxcar uh, towards the end of June. Hopefully they'll have it back to us by the end of August, sometime in September. Uh, we're in the process of raising money for this project. So far, we have received a $5,000 Nisqually Charitable Tr Trust grant. We have received $4,400 from LTAC. We have a $500 Squaxin Island Charitable Trust grant. And we just recently received a $6,000 donation from the Over the Hill Gang Volks March Club out of Graham. Um, and I think the reason we got this was because um, if you all know, knew Jerry Williams, who used to be the uh, museum coordinator, he was a member of this uh, club and pretty much kept it going. And they've got kind of a soft spot in their hearts for Jerry and Jerry was very much interested in trains. So I think we probably get the, got the donation because of that. Then we also had um, $7,800 in our general fund that was designated funds for maintenance of, on the um, train. So right now we're up to $24,000, which means we're about halfway there. We're about ready to start a major fund drive. Uh, we hope that everybody will get excited about restoring um, the boxcar and contribute to us. Uh, we also have four other grants out for consideration, which um, hopefully we'll, we'll get something back for those. Then the last thing I want to mention, I'm not going to go into much detail on this, um, the Pierce County Heritage League and the Washington State Historical Society has started a movement or a push to um, get all museums in Pierce County to have a plan, an emergency disaster plan. What would you do if you had a disaster? How would you protect your and um, restore your collection if, if say we had a fire or say we had a flood or something like that in the uh, broken pipes in the museum. There's a lot of us who don't have a disaster plan that I know of, at least the historical society doesn't. Um, and there's a lot of us that are not trained in how to take care of, of our collection once it's been damaged. So their push is to get all of us trained or to get a plan and then to get us all trained in what we would need to do to protect our collection or to, once it had been damaged, what do we do to uh, keep it from being further damaged and to um, take better care of it. So um, those are the two things that the Historical Society and the museum are kind of focusing on this year. Um, that's all I have for you this evening. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to um, try to answer them for you, or if you want larger, uh, more in-depth uh, question or answers, just send us an email and we'll be happy to answer the email back to you. Deputy Mayor Winkler. I'm super excited about the paint job being all lined up. That's, oh, that's great news. <laughs> that's, that's absolutely wonderful. Um, would you take a moment to uh, introduce your other volunteers here so that we can give them a round of, all of you a round of applause for all the work that you do. So um, two other people that are on the Historical Society board are Robin Goldsby and Pete Stoltz. All right, well, thanks, Scott. I don't know if anybody got to read the last slide that was up there, but um, uh, the Historical Society has been in partnership with the city in keeping the museum open for 47 years. So that's quite a long time for us to be working together. We appreciate all of your support and all of your um, help that you give us. Carol, thank you for your many years of volunteer service. Thank we you. We appreciate it. Thank you. And we have one proclamation tonight. Whereas each 22nd day of April since 1970, the nation and the world demonstrated support for environmental protection by celebrating Earth Day. And whereas this Earth Day's objective has always been to educate the public about environmental issues, 
And this year's theme is Planet versus Plastics. And whereas this year's Earth Day theme unites students, parents, businesses, governments, churches, unions, and individuals in an unwavering commitment to call for the end of plastics for the sake of human and planetary health, demanding a 60% reduction in the production of plastics by 2040, and an ultimate goal of building a plastic-free future for generations to come. And whereas to achieve a 60% reduction by 2040, EarthDay.org's goals are one, raising public awareness about plastics harm to human and biodiversity health, pushing for research transparency, proposing to phase out single-use plastics by 2030 and achieving this phase-out commitment in the United Nations Treaty on Plastic Pollution in 2024, three, advocating for policies aimed at combating the environmental impact of fast fashion, which relies on the use of synthetic materials made of plastics, such as polyester and nylon, and four, investing in innovative technologies and materials to build a plastic-free world. And whereas by educating people about the impact of plastics, we can inspire them to take action to protect the planet. And whereas by working together on Earth Day and throughout the year, the citizens of DuPont can help create a sustainable future for our planet and all its inhabitants. Now, therefore, be it resolved that I, Ronald J. Frederick, Mayor of the City of DuPont, Washington, do hereby proclaim April 22nd, 2024, as Earth Day in the City of DuPont, and encourage all citizens of DuPont to join me in this special observance, signed this ninth day of April, 2024. Next, we have the approval of the consent agenda, so I'll entertain um, a motion for that. Council Member Ballard? Yes, Mayor, I move to approve the consent agenda items for uh, Tuesday, April 9, 2024. Council Member Bassan? I second the motion. Any further discussion? Seeing none, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. Opposed? The consent agenda is approved. Next, we start on our uh, study session items. And the first item is our new DuPont website overview. And uh, Larry McRae is going to cover that information. Good evening, everybody. I just wanted to do it. Okay. Sorry, I'm switching mics here. Um, I wanted to do a quick overview of our new website that went live um, at the end of last month. Um, this project started about eight months ago and um, Civic Plus, our website provider, contacted us and um, told us that we were eligible for this, what they called an ultimate uh, redesign package, which was basically free except for staff time, but can't beat that. So we jumped all over that. So we created a team, which consisted of Carrie Muir, Karma Oaksmith, um, Kelly LaMotta from the police department and Emma Weekend from Parks and Rec and myself. So after we met with Civic, we, um, after they told us what our assignments were, we our first assignment was to look at um, counties and cities across the state that use the same package. So um, we literally poured over dozens of different county and city websites to look at elements that we liked. So when we came back together, we talked about them and that is basically, we just picked the elements we liked and we kind of were drawn to the same four or five different websites. So that's how we came up with the design for our new website. So um, the content in the in the website hasn't changed. So all these all these landing pages are still the same. So basically, what you're going to see different is is the front web page right here. And one of the first changes you're going to see is the fact that the picture we had before was just a standing standalone picture. Right now, we get to have a carousel of many pictures. So one of the first ones you'll see when you open the website is this one right here of the home course. And we just recently added the mayor's message. So if you click on this right here, go to the mayor's welcome message. 
and this is kind of fun because we get these are pretty interchangeable. So if we have the sequala shoot photo challenge, we can change those pictures out and showcase showcase those pictures. And you know, one of the things that we were looking at on this website, we wanted to make sure that information was easily accessible for citizens. That was the biggest thing we wanted to to do. And then also, you know, showcase um, what our city has to offer, which is parks and trails and and events and all that fun stuff. So we wanted to make sure those were visible for everybody to see. So if you scroll down here, this is where our quick links start. And one of the things we did too, Civic um, provide us, provided us with these analytical reports that showed what citizens were clicking on when they visited our website. And that is how we came up with the categories here. So in this first set of quick links, I'm not gonna click on everyone, but this will take you to the landing page to pay your water bill. Um, this will take you right to the um, Parks and Rec page for all the up-to-date activities that, that are going on. This quick link here will take you to council business. It will take you to the document center, which will um, show you if you want to look up a resolution or a current agenda, those types of things. And the report, a concern and compliment, I'm gonna let Karma talk about in just a minute. Um, this will take you to the municipal code and I will click, click on notify me. This one is an important one because I would encourage citizens to visit this page because and sign up for notify me because this is where you're gonna get the latest and greatest information, whether it be just general city news, calendar items, um, any kind of an emergency alert um, and news flashes. And that would include our weekly um, newsletter, the weekly bits and bytes. So um, please visit that because you can choose your preferences, whether you would like to have an email or a text message or both. So that's an important one. Okay, and if you scroll down a little further, there's even more quick link buttons. And again, I won't go through all of them, but You've got your pet licensing, um, the current city's active development projects, information regarding rental housing license, um, any job opportunities we have available. Um, if you're looking for a key staff person, you'll find it here. Um, doing business in DuPont will take you right up to this, this tab here, which would include, uh, sorry, building codes, licenses, taxes, all those kinds of things. Um, current permit information, information on our fee schedule, and all of the latest and greatest on our beautiful parks and trails. And if you scroll a little further down, we've got even more quick link buttons, which I just love. This will take you to the landing page for city government, which will give you all the city government resources, our weekly newsletter, bits and bytes, and this is a quick link to the Stillicum School District. And this part to me is the fun part. This is our news flash, which I think this really can, this showcases just the latest tidbits of information the city has, whether it be a press release. Um, right here, we've got alley maintenance going on, um, the parks and rec guide. Um, we've got events coming up, the shred event, spring cleanup. Um, just a lot of different things that you can put on here are important um, Purple Heart event that's coming up on May 2nd, um, things like that. So I think that's a fun fun way to showcase those things and, and easily accessible for citizens. And then further down, we've got our um, calendar events, which include meetings. And then any special event like a Parks and Rec event or a city event. And if you scroll a little bit further down, you're towards the end here and it gives the city information. Um, these pieces down here um, showcase our city Facebook account. We do use Twitter. Um, this is the Parks and Rec's Instagram. There's other social media accounts and unfortunately we can't have them all. So if you click that little button, this will show all of the city's social media accounts and how to get there. Okay. Yeah. And that basically 
basically concludes it. And if you have any questions for me, I will turn it over to Karma. Council Member Ballard. Great job. It's uh, it's very colorful and uh, it's captivating um, during, during our um, annual meeting of newly elected where we got together and decided uh, what our mission statement and vision statement were going to be. Uh, I see this as a great place to put it front and center. So if there's someone that could take a look at that um, as to how it could be front and center, where people coming there know immediately what DuPont's all about in addition to the mayor's statement. I think that would be wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, that's a fabulous idea. I can work on that. Council Member Basa. Um, yes, Lara, is there a section for Civic Plus? Is that underneath the Parks and Rec section? Is it? Um, can, is there a place that you could click just out of curiosity? Um, can you be more specific when you mean Civic Plus? Yeah, that, Civic Plus is the- um, Our website provider? No, no, the program, is it, I'm so, sorry, Civic Rec, goodness. Oh, <laughs> Civic yes, I Rec. apologize. Um, well, that is a very good question. Okay, yes. Oh, right here. Oh, good. This, yes. Yes, it goes straight there now. Okay, this is good. Yeah, that's all I wanted to know. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Yeah, thank you. Okay, uh, one other thing that uh, we didn't mention is that uh, prior to the previous uh, iteration of the web page, this is totally smartphone uh, compatible. So uh, people can... Uh, do all this on their smartphones they don't have to go to a computer yes thanks mayor for mentioning that and i also wanted to mention too that the website we um are ada accessible now as well so if you click on this little um, icon down here and if you can change your settings if you want to change the colors or the the font size those types of things so that's that's a pretty important feature as well so thank you larry thank you Next, we have Director Oaksmith, who's going to talk about the C Click Fix software overview. We wanted to have a more interactive process for the residents of DuPont to report a problem. Right now, if they have a sign down or they see a bear, they call City Hall or they start, they wave down a police officer or they do, they email the mayor. We really wanted something that would work with the residents and with our staff to make sure that a work order was like a work order or request was in the system and there was a response to the to this to the resident. So we looked at all, a lot of different software. We had an aging software that the public works team used themselves and maybe some of the older police officers, but uh, it was outdated and old. So um we actually looked at quite a few software and what we found was the one that had the best pricing and the best information was right in the whole Civic Plus family. So if you're on our website or you're on the mobile phone, you can go to how do I on our, um, on our website and you can report a problem here or you can scroll down as Lara was showing you earlier to report a concern or a compliment in case you really want to talk about how much you love the finance director, you can go right in here and um, do a compliment. There are a lot of um, people out on the street that want to call in and say, hey, our public works department, they did a great job doing this or that. And sometimes they don't have time to call. This would be a good resource for them to just do a compliment that way. So when you go to this landing page, you'll see C Click Fix. That's the name of our 311 mobile app. Is it's it, you can do it on your phone or you can do it this way, and you can report a problem. So when you click on that, it brings up this site where you can see that here's the city of Dupont, and you can pick a category. You can do a search, or you can go down and and look at all the fun things that uh, good or bad that you need to talk about for the city that you want to that you have a concern about. You can go. Um, all through this list, we have many different types of, of um, topics, I guess you would say. And if you can't find it, you can always pick other. But let's say you were driving and you noticed that um, um, there is a pothole. So you could look for pothole, you could click on it, 
And what you can do on your phone or here on your computer is you can pick a location by, by moving the map around, or you can put type in an address at the top. And what will happen is if you pick a, an area outside of DuPont, it will not let you do a work order or um, this, because it, some people don't know where the division of DuPont is. So they, if they try to pick JBLM property, uh, it will tell you that's not within uh, the parameter. So let's say I just picked, there's a pothole here on Haskins. I would confirm the location, just push that button. If I had a picture, I could easily upload it. Uh, that would help our staff and team understand where this, what the problem looked like. Um, if you don't have a photo, you just click no photo. And then you would put in the description uh, where the pothole is. Each topic has different um, parameters. So we'll just say it's by a curb. Could put some more information in. How deep is the pothole? Well, after I measured it, I would say whatever the that's the how the depth is, and then I would confirm the details. Oh, it wants me to put some information in. There we go. And then it would let you review the work order you're putting in. And if you hit, um, then you can do it as yourself so that everyone will see that whoever you are, your username would show up and you'll get an email with some information back. You can hide your identity. There's no problem with that. You will still um, receive emails, but no one will know who you are. Or you can submit as a guest, which you would not have to sign up an account. Um, and you, you can submit that work order or compliment, but you would not receive any updates. Then you hit next. So I'm just going to do submit as myself, hit next. You would sign in or register. We'll never email you anything except what you've put in. There's no advertising or anything that'll come. And once you register and submit, you hit enter. That, that work order or compliment goes off to the appropriate person at the city. And they will get an email that says, we've got a pothole. Larry Clark probably in Public Works would get that email and he would respond and you will get an email back when the person has accepted and acknowledged the problem. If, if they um, have any more questions, they'll email you on that or if you leave information to call. So that's one topic that I want to show you something else that's nice because sometimes we don't know if it's a city situation or not. So we we call, um, we call the city and say, hey, there's a light out. And sometimes it is a city light, but sometimes it's not. So let's look. Let's say you have a um, problem with your electricity or natural gas and it's out, but you don't know who to call. You can click on here. And what it does, instead of walking you through that resource of putting in where and, and everything, it tells you right now that our organization doesn't accept this category because it's not the responsibility of the city. It's responsibility of Puget Sound Energy. So it gives you the website, their phone number, or if it's an emergency, what to do. So there's a lot of topics like that that you'll see that don't belong to the city, but will help the residents and guide them the right way. And we're going to have a few that are multifaceted. Uh, for example, the bear issue. It's not on here yet, but sometimes we need to know so that we can respond if it's an injured animal, but also fish and wildlife will need to know. So we're working on that. So it's a really wonderful uh, way to um, put in information that the city needs to know for many, many topics. Um, you can see here abandoned vehicle, um, if you have a question about backflow or irrigation and so forth. And what I think the best part is, is the client or customer or resident will receive information back in a timely manner so they know it's being worked on and they'll receive information when the project or concern is done. So I'm really excited about this product. Um, my team, the finance team worked on it really hard to get uh, everything in line and then worked with every department to figure out who needs to know this information. And we think it'll be a growing, <laughs> as things happen, we'll, we'll find out if there's on the other category, if there's a growing need for um, another category here, we'll just continue to grow and learn um, as the residents use it. So thank you everyone for your patience while we went through this. And I'm excited that uh, we have now have a resource that you can do on your mobile phone or your computer. You don't have to call in or come into the city to do something wonderful like a compliment or let the city know that there's something that needs attention. So let me know if you have any questions. Council Member Elliott. 
think this is just awesome. So thank you all. Thank you to your whole team. And I'm wondering if maybe we could advertise this on the Suburban Times, because sometimes it's difficult to get information out to our citizens. And if we could put something out there about, hey, we've got this new program, click it and see it, um, or see it and click it, it might it might really help. Sure. So, um, we, uh, Lara did uh, information in our newsletter as well, which is good. But the more the more information we can get out, the better. So yeah, we, we will look into that. No yeah. problem. Thank so you. kudos. Thank you all. Appreciate it. And this is uh, one example of a continuous improvement that the staff works on. So uh, I appreciate all your efforts as well. Uh, Karma, you can uh, just stay there. Up, you got the next item, uh, the traffic camera update. So I go ahead. Need, I might need Carrie to help me with this. <laughs> let me let her get the, the screen sharing up. Okay, tonight I'd like to talk a little bit about the traffic uh, camera enforcement. Uh, we've had a lot of discussion about this. We've had the program in place just about 10 months, um, and I'm going to give you some background and history. I have Chief Newman here in case we need him, but we worked together on this with our city administrator to make sure we had a thorough report for the residents and council to answer questions that they might have about this um, enforcement program. So we'll get started. We'll um, go ahead to the next slide, please. Well, the first, I'm going to give you a little background in history. Next. So with the council, we meet every year to figure out what their priorities are for the residents and the city. And many, many times public safety has been at the top. So in 2022, in the strategic planning session, pedestrian safety was the council's number one priority for the residents. And they requested us to bring forward ideas to help with public safety and modern technology. Where could we where could we make it work better for our residents and keep the, our pedestrians safe here in the city? We had Chief Newman, he took the idea for, with that and went out and did a, an automated traffic camera study. And um, we also learned while we were doing this, um, we're compiling information from, from all the departments that the number one resident complaint was traffic safety. Next slide. When this enforcement study was completed, Chief Newman brought that to council and he did, um, that was done in 2021, the enforcement study, and he presented that to council on June 14th of 2022. They looked at um, many different areas and there were five major areas that were studied that had uh, in the past a lot of issues or concerns from the police department and residents. And, and when the study was done, they suggested that we put seven cameras up in the city to help regulate speed and um, running of red lights. And so it, Chief Newman brought that forward to the council and asked that we could put those uh, cameras in. And in 2022, the council gave the blessing to go ahead and install those. We installed the seven cameras um, in May of 2023 and let the residents know these were going in the best we could by public information. We gave them a month free tickets, so to speak. So the residents and or anyone driving in the city of DuPont would get a ticket if they did um, ran a red light at those cameras or sped in the school zones and they would get a ticket that said, hey, this is a warning. There's no fine with this, but we want to let you know next month it will happen. So in June of 2023 is when that grace period ended and uh, the infractions started becoming real for the anyone driving in the city of DuPont. Most of the cameras are located um, right along Center Drive at different areas. And then we have one on the uh, historical side of DuPont and on the Barksdale Light. Um, and again, I said there was no fee for the first month. So now I'm going to talk about the financial information with these cameras. 
Right here, you can see a slide that was provided to us by Novia Global that showed in 2023, starting in June, as you work your way to December, that we had 9,626 infractions on those from those cameras. Um, the, the orange or kind of red is red light cameras. The blue is the total. Well, let me start from the left, sorry. The blue is the total number of infractions. Then the red light camera infractions are the orange. And then the green are the school zone infractions. And you can see July and there were no, no green because the school wasn't in session. And that was 2023. And the next slide shows 2024. This is the first three months of the year. We've, they have been issued, they have issued, excuse me, 4,590 citations. That'd be the proper word verbiage, I guess, tickets, citations. Again, the total is in blue. The next in orange are red light infractions and the green are school zone infractions. What's the, what concerns me the most on this is how high the school zone infractions are. Those are where our children are dry, walking to and from school or in the evening after after school sports. This is one of the reasons council wanted this done is to protect those children, our future residents of DuPont from injury and harm. So um, I'm hoping those tickets will help people understand that they need to slow down. Next slide. Of those infractions, we looked at how many of those vehicles are registered in DuPont with this DuPont zip code. It is a little bit difficult in the city because we do have a high number of military who don't register their cars here because they don't have to. But of the tickets that we did um, issue, 35.58 were DuPont zip codes and the other 64% or 64.42 what were, um, ish were for other zip codes. Next slide. We'll talk about expenses for a moment. Those cameras that we have, we rent. They're not city owned property, which means we don't have to pay for the maintenance, which is nice if anything needs to be done. The team from Novia Global comes out and takes care of um, the, the um, cameras. We have four red light cameras that um, these are the maximum fees that they would charge us for the rentals, $3,999 per month. One special red light camera that's almost $6,000 per month and two fixed school zone cameras that have a tiered system based on how many infractions are done during that time. I can't say per month because sometimes those cameras are off during the off times for school, but the minimum for the rental fee is 3,999. But if we issue more than 800 fractions, then the city would pay $5,700. So if you kind of look at that holistically a month, the, the ma monthly maximum rental fee would be $33,395 for those seven cameras or $400,740 for the annual fee plus sales tax. Um, one of the good things that the company did for uh, the city is when the school breaks are in session, the cameras are not recording, but they, they still have to maintain those cameras. So they still charge us a fee, but they've given us a discount of 25%. Next slide. We have some expenses related to the cameras besides rental. Of course, we have to pay Lakewood Court Services. Uh, for doing the citations, we have court almost every Wednesday for an officer to go to talk about um, traffic court. Uh, anyone that wants to contest their um, ticket can go during that time. Uh, it's usually two to three hours on a Wednesday. And luckily for us at this time, our officers have been able to go during their normal um, course of business. We haven't incurred any overtime but I did put this on here because if if they had to come in on a time that was not their regular scheduled time, we'd have to pay overtime. So right now, the city of Lakewood Court Services is charging um, the city $20,248 a month to use the to use their services. Yes, they do it for other items as well, but we have seen a significant increase since this started. And in fact, we just got a notice that in April of this month, 
<laughs> that our court fees are going from $20,248 to $33,367. And that says right in the letter specifically due to the traffic infractions. And that's okay. We, we have to have that to be able to have residents and or anyone that gets a ticket to be able to do their due diligence to contest if they'd like to. Uh, next slide, please. So here on this slide um, are the total expenses for 2023, 24, and the, and the total of those together since we've started this program. And this is through February. I don't have March statistics for you on the expenses yet. So our, so far, we the city's spent uh, just under three, well, $399,229.30. Uh, on the revenue side, when a person drives and gets an infraction, the fraction varies. It depends on what they did. And I'm no expert on that, but the police department could weigh in a little more if they'd like, but they're going to be based on, did you run a red light? How fast were you going through the school zone? So those tickets are unique to codes that I, um, I don't have information on, but the payments from those tickets, when a person gets a ticket, go directly to Lakewood Court and then it usually takes about two months for the city to receive that revenue. Now, what we get is staggered because it depends on when the person who caught the infraction paid. Most of us would pay right away and be quite embarrassed that we <laughs> ran through a school zone. Some people don't. We have a, they have a collections agency um, in place with Lakewood Court as well. So there's no way to really track if a person got a ticket in June and we got the money in October for the city. We don't track that. But we do know it's about a two-month lag. The revenue we received in 2023 was $332,802. And so far in 2024, um, just for January and February, it was 487,000, I'm gonna round. But that is not January and February's revenue. That's about a two month slag. So that's probably a lot of November and December revenue. Um, and the total gross revenue is at the bottom. I'm starting to lose my voice a little. So I'll let you just read that. <laughs> And then we'll move to the next slide. This is a summary, very hard to see, but we will we will send this out. And this just shows you uh, what I just talked about financially in a summary form. So if you're looking at this slide, you'll see the very top row is Lakewood court expenses by the month, then the camera rental expenses by the month, infraction revenue by the month. And then if we had a net gain or net loss, um, you'll see 2023 from the left to over one that's got the, the blue header and then the first two months of 2024. And if you wanted to do that as a whole, we put the total down on the bottom left, the net that the city received between June of 2023 and February of 2024 is $421,000. And that's all I have for this evening. So please let me know what questions you have. Councilmember Ballard. Thank you for the breakdown, Karma. Uh, it's nice to have the uh, kind of the roll up on your side of the, the equation, right? Um, I'm looking at it from a, how many infractions there were standpoint, a public safety standpoint. And, you know, um, like Rep Levitt said, um, I was almost a math major, but I, I wasn't. So this is kind of beer math. But you consider in the month of January that the school zone infractions alone were 1,200. And if you also include in January that there's some school holiday involved in there, um, I was only able to average it out to 40 infractions a day over 31 days. OK, so if you take the few school days that were involved there when that light was flashing, it's probably closer to 60, 50 or 60 infractions in a school zone a day, which is uh, which is serious. The other statistic that's very important to me is the fact that 65 percent of the infractions are coming in from folks out of town. And uh, you think if someone worked here, they would, you know, get the idea. I do see the trend that we spoke of previously when we initially thought of putting these cameras in, the kind of Pavlovian approach to things that once things kind of people got the word, the number of infractions would go down over time. 
And uh, certainly if you look at the, the graph, it does look like the number of infractions is reducing, which is a wonderful thing. So um, in that regard, I'm happy that our community is more safe. Um, certainly staring at 1,200 school zone infractions during a month where there's reduced number of school days is quite shocking. Um, if you look at it from a per day number of citations that are issued. So um, thank you very much. I'm gonna jump here, uh, Deputy Mayor, to uh, Council Member Gastic. She has her hand up, so go ahead, Council Member. Thank you. I wanted to know what percentage of the proceeds have actually been collected. So I see that you had a net figure in there, but what is the uncollected amount? And do we have a, a percentage or a ratio on that? I don't have it right now, but I can get that information. I was provided it once before. I just never asked okay. for, but I was kind of shocked the first time we asked last year how many mm -hmm. fractions were unpaid. But oh, yeah, uh, I, I'll check back in and I'll send that information out. Okay. No yeah, problem. I would like to know. Uh, the other question I had is if the uh, infraction goes unpaid when someone goes to renew their driver's license, is this something that would prevent them from renewing it if it's unpaid? Um, right now, what we have in place with Lakewood Court is if they don't pay, they get a reminder and then they get uh, a collections letter and they will go to collections. Um, it does not, uh, it's a completely separate. Okay. Again, I don't know. It's completely it's separate like, from their license. So it's not like getting yeah. pulled over and getting a ticket where that would stop you from being able to renew your license at some point. Council member, can I, Mayor, can I step in real quick? Sure. So, so, yeah, council member, yeah, so as a matter of state law, one of the compromises that was made when the state allowed municipalities to put in red light cameras and traffic control cameras was that what you're exactly what you're saying. It does not show up on your driver's record. Okay. Still a civil citation and it shows up as a civil citation, but it, it's not part of your driving record. So Okay. Thank you. That helps. I appreciate that. Chief Newman's here. Do you want to say anything uh, on that topic or just Okay, we'll okay. hold off then. Okay. Um next is uh Deputy Mayor Winkler. Um thanks for all the information. Greatly appreciate it. I too share the I'm glad to see the numbers going down. That that is, you know, we want people to be safe, and that that was the whole purpose of it. Really glad to see the numbers going down. Um, a lot of good data there. My only request is, could we have a similar update in the November time frame to see how much that data continues to go down, and then ninety days after a certain bill was signed, which should be right around one July, um, the legislative changes go in there for if people qualify for state programs they can ask for a reduced rate and just to look into making sure that our our costs are being met so i think uh it'd be we would almost need september and october data at a minimum to really look at that because there will be little to no data during the summertime there'd be less data but so maybe november december we can get another update but thank you sure i just want to let you know it is a budget season so i'll do my best uh, yeah, I'm like, oh, Council it's, it's really busy at the, at the end of the year. Hey, comment. So I just wanted to make sure. So, so these are infractions that that are tickets that were issued. So if if someone puts in the affidavit saying I wasn't driving, and and you know that the whole process where you don't have to, you can say I wasn't driving, and and then it gets dismissed. Those numbers are still in here because it's the infraction. Uh, this is based on the infraction, not by not not anything that might have been taken off because of it's been being dismissed or anything, right? Yes, sir. That's correct. Okay. This, this is an aggregate of all payable citations that have been issued. In that case, where they file an affidavit where they weren't driving the vehicle, mm -hmm. that's a matter for the court. Okay. And the court weighs that, okay. and there are several factors that go into that. Got it. Thank you, Council Member Elliott. I was just going to point out, too, that even though the school zone infractions are going down, it looks like the red light infractions are inching up. And that's a very dangerous corner up there on, on uh, McNeil and, and Center. So hopefully people will 
will pay more attention. If you're crossing the street there, it's a horrible place. Chief, do you have some other comments you want to make? Well, just a couple of things for perspective. Um, the community might be asking, why is the finance director presenting this information? And it's because th th when we designed this program, we had several different options. And we specifically wanted to silo um, tracking revenues um, away from public safety, away from the police department. We don't track the revenues. That's the finance director does that, 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 um, we're, we're a smaller city, so obviously sometimes we have to cross-communicate with one another. Another, But this uh, does not go directly to public safety. This goes to the general fund. State law does uh, allow two options, one for traffic safety enforcement and one for the general fund. And we decided uh, that obviously we wanted the general fund because there is a perception that this is a money-making scheme or a money-grabbing scheme or whatnot. And, you know, I'm sent, you know, we're sensitive to that. I think the community also needs to know that this council was very sincere uh, with their concerns about specifically pedestrian safety. And we have a large school zone. So this was an instruction directly from the office of the mayor as part of his strategic initiatives to make sure we had a safer community. Um, and uh, again, as we talked about earlier, that our emphasis on traffic safety has caused, we have the data to support that we have re reduced collisions by almost 50%, 48% over a five-year span, and just over the last year by, by a, a almost 30%, 29% reduction in collisions. This does allow, um, and I do understand the, the concern the community has, but this does allow us then to, um, it's not a force multiplier so much as we're able to then allocate other operational resources to other areas in the city. And I've also heard uh, some criticisms about the, the legality of this. Um, the same system is being used in Fife, in Tacoma, in, in many other jurisdictions. Um, Seattle has uh, automatic traffic enforcement cameras. Um, there's some advantages to that. It removes officer to civilian contact. So the allegations of vice-based policing are removed from that equation. Um, <clears throat> but uh, we can assure you that uh, we don't track speed, just speed cameras in general, they're illegal in the state of Washington. There are exceptions. Those exceptions are school zones in the case of DuPont, also hospitals, parks. Um, and I believe that they just passed new legislation for construction uh, areas on, on I-5. But then we have red light cameras. Um, and also our thresholds, if, if a citizen needs to know if you're doing one mile over or your speedometer is not calibrated exactly, the system's not going to trigger. We set those thresholds to give anywhere between a four to six mile cushion. And I'm not going to, unless the mayor orders me to tell you what that cushion is, because everyone should be doing the speed limit. But we all also understand that our citizens are human, that our drivers are human. Um, and then the last thing, we have a very strong policy. We don't give exceptions. We don't give exceptions to law enforcement or public safety or city employees or council members. Um, the exceptions to law enforcement and public safety are the same exceptions that are in RCW, that they have to justify that they were in a legitimate law enforcement capacity, responding to a call in an urgent manner. Other than that, we've issued citations to lots of, lots of um, uh, city employees, some of them from outside of our city. So with that, that's, that I, I just wanted to be clear why we have kind of the siloed finance director, police chief. And we really are trying to do that as small as we are. It's hard. We all wear a lot of different hats, but we, we did, we were very sensitive to the perception, uh, the, the possible negative perception of this program. And we wanted to make sure that we siloed that as much as possible. Thank you, chief. And uh, the fact is, if you're going to speed limit, you don't get a ticket. Is that correct? That's the rumor I've heard. <laughs> Actually, that's not a rumor. That is the law. Um, you are correct, sir. Yeah. And there, there are exceptions to everything. And if there's equipment violations or whatnot, the court will hear that too and take that into consideration. Thank you. Thank you, Karma. Next, we're going to have a little change of subject here. And we have a comp plan update uh, from Director Kincaid. Thank you, Mayor, Council. We've been talking um, for, for many months, just kind of regular updates on the sub area plan update. And a sub area plan is uh, we've discussed is kind of a mini comp plan. It lives inside the overall citywide comp plan. So this is our evening to kick off uh, what we call the 
periodic review um, and update of the citywide comprehensive plan, which is a requirement of the Growth Management Act. So this first screen, we um, just to start with, this is a, a vision statement that we operate under now. Our uh, comprehensive plan has um, was last adopted in 20, or updated, pardon me, in 2015. Um, and it's due now under the requirement of the GMA for, um, for adoption of update by December of 2024. From that date on, uh, comprehensive periodic updates that are required by the um, GMA are done every 10 year cycle. So this is the uh, vision statement that we have in our um, adopted comp plan. Um, that the city of DuPont is a model small city known for its plan setting and hometown sense of community, a place that blends its natural beauty, rich Northwest history, and vibrant economy with a proactive approach to its future. Next slide. What is a comprehensive plan? I think many of you have uh, experience with comprehensive plan, but but I think that for, for those people that... Um, Maybe listening that this could be the first uh, time that they've heard, you know, of a comprehensive plan and an update and what in the world is that, um, and why is why do we care? Basically, it's really hard to sort of help people understand just how critically important comprehensive planning or general planning is. It's a long look, a twenty-year planning horizon that um, incorporates the goals and policies that really become the 20 year blueprint for uh, what a city or county, um, how, how they'll manage their budget, how they'll plan their capital improvements, their you know, infrastructure, um, what the land use, uh, what goes where, how is that gonna be compatible? How is that gonna serve the community? So it's, um, and it serves the basis for um, then becoming um, implemented through the development regulations. So comprehensive plans, they are a policy document of the administration that then it turns into the regulatory framework that we know <clears throat> as the Dumont, DuPont Municipal Code. So we're, we're, we're operating on a horizon for this one of 2024 to 2044. Um, again, like I said, guides the physical development of the community provides the basis of decisions for land use, transportation, housing, capital facilities, parks, economic development, and our environmental protection. Um, what it also does is establishes what's called level of service standards. So um, we'll be talking a lot more about that. You know, a level of service standard is kind of what it sounds like, where we, we look at um, what is acceptable for um, let's say example, a trans a road, level service for a roadway. What is acceptable for how long somebody sits at a traffic light? How is that roadway operating? So these are the kind of metrics that we use or maybe for parks, level of service. How many parks do we have per capita? Is that acceptable? Do we, do, can we accept that or do we wanna um, raise that level of service? So these are very um, important for the livability and the, um, you know, the, the city overall, the community and how um, how it functions for people to, to be, you know, happy, <laughs> happy where they live. Um, it, we are uh, also, uh, like I said, in the conference of plan, you're going to update your zoning and your development regulations to be consistent. Um, you're trying to balance the public interest, which we know um, in bridging that gap of what we are now and what that vision says, where we want to be. Um, in that 20 year planning horizon, balancing public interests um, and fiscal responsibility and all that is not an easy thing to do, um, obviously, but that's, that's our biggest goal to try to accomplish that to the best of our ability. So again, I told you it was a, a requirement um, and every 10 years it must be done, um, but we do have an opportunity. This is a really important thing that I like to help people understand that it's supposed to be a dynamic working document. Okay, so even though people are like, wow, we just adopted by ordinance this this, this thing, this big rule book, um, it is supposed to be um, amended if needed on an annual basis. So let's just say we put something down that gets adopted and we realize that that isn't really quite what we intended. There's some consequences from that we would, we would like to 
change, then you have the opportunity as a council, as a citizen, um, as landowner to petition every year to amend that, whether it's amending the map and the land use, or it's amending some of these goals and policies that provide that baseline for, for how decisions get made in the city. Next slide, please. So this is just simply um, the Growth Management Act is housed in RCW 3670A, um, and it has been, um, you know, it's been it it has been evolving over time. At least you know since it was first adopted in 94, 96, and um, and and been maybe some people are thinking perfected. Maybe <laughs> it depends on your viewpoint, but it has changed over time. But these goals, these are the goals that were initially put um, into the the GMA by our legislature. And um, so the goals are the, you know, uh, addressing urban growth, um, reducing sprawl, sprawling growth that goes outside of um, city boundaries into rural areas. Um, and transportation is a goal, making sure that your uh, transportation network in cities, counties, and regionally um, are, are compatible. Uh, housing. Uh, you heard uh, Representative Levitt talk about housing a little bit and, and how much, how many, I don't remember what her number was, how many houses we're going to need. It's a lot. It's a big number. Um, as our population grows, uh, those everyone needs to have a place to live. So you'll find that housing in this cycle and in the last couple of years in the legislature have been um, extremely um, you know, ex extremely fo extreme focus, let's put it that way, that we'll have to address in this periodic update. Economic development is a goal. Property rights are a goal. Permits are a goal. Resource lands are a goal. Open space, recreation, environment, citizen participation, public facility services, historic preservation, shorelines, and our newest goal, um, which is just from this last uh, session in the legislature is uh, climate change and resiliency. So um, the way that the GMA, uh, you know, frames all of this, that no one, not one of these goals is more important than the other. They're supposed to be all balanced uh, in our comprehensive plan and in the goals and policies. Next slide. So requirements, um, as I said, we've got to meet these uh, requirements that are not just from uh, under commerce, under the GMA. I mean, I shouldn't say it that way. That's the wrong way to phrase it. The GMA is the overarching, but within that we have the Puget Sound Regional Council and we have Pierce County countywide planning policies. And you see that graphic, you know, our, our local lock, lock comprehensive plan is gonna nest inside of the countywide policies, the multi-county po policies and the state goals and policies. So, um, you know, with the intent that ultimately if we could um, all be consistently working off of the same goals and policies or towards the same goals, I should say, that the state of Washington would be, um, you know, a, a healthier uh, place that uh, fiscally better, better place to live. And, and, and that's, what, that's what this is all put in place to try to do. Next slide. So the requirements, I've got, a, when I, you know, I, this was a, this was a fast moving session um, and there was a lot that happened. So uh, we've talked about in, in previous council meetings about this growth target um, uh, by the Office of Financial Management that's part of our GMA requirement is that we take our population share and that um, is 5,184 more people by 2044. So that's kind of one of these baseline things and those housing targets and the job targets are all part of, they start the, they start the bubble of where we head in this, in the work that we're gonna do. Um, but then you add in um, House Bill 1110, which is, you're gonna, we're gonna be talking a lot about housing um, in this work that we're do, about to do uh, this, City of DuPont is what's called a tier three. So you've got tier one, two, and three cities uh, based on population. We're a tier three, we're a smaller population, but still the requirements um, have to be met for this middle housing ordinance. And we will really get into a lot more detail about that. And I was really pleased. I know that some of you have mentioned that you've been watching the planning commission. So, so some of these things are, are 
you are probably resonating with like, oh yeah, that all that middle housing and you know it's a duplex up to a townhouse, a sixplex. And so that's very that's going to be a lot really helpful because um, there's a lot of detail that will be coming uh, to you pretty soon. Uh, House Bill 1337, accessory dwelling units or ADUs. That is something that is now um, in, it's, you can't deny that. You cannot deny that. And um, there's a couple of, there's two conflicting, two conflicting pieces of legislature. We are going to, our approach is going to go with um, that we, we must allow one ADU per single family lot. And so basically you don't ever have a single family lot anymore. You have potentially two homes on a lot and density will not be factored as you may have been used to hearing it with so many dwelling units per acre. It's now a unit count, how many units. So that's a whole different way of looking at it. And uh, House Bill 1220, is, is key for all of these requirements to look at um, goals and policies that we are providing affordable housing to all economic segments of the population. It went really deep this time, and it used to be sort of this general, more of a general statement in the GMA, and now we have um, income level housing bans with target numbers and different types of housing, very specific now, much more specific than it ever was. Senate Bill 5258 impact fees. I just had a wonderful conversation with Sean Lewis from the uh, Silicon School District about ADUs and impact fees. So there's some um, legislation on that um, that we have to we have to work with. Um, and again, the metrics. When I was saying the the, the methodology that we previously used as planners um, to change how we calculate density. There's also a change in this Senate bill to change the methodology and how you calculate impact fees. So we're going to be required any city and school district, of course, they have their school impact fees. City, we have fire impact fees. We've talked about potentially park and transportation. We're going to have to now adopt this schedule um, that's not a one size fits all, but it is correlating with the size of the housing unit and the um, and the potential impact. So smaller house, you know, perceived to have less impact, bigger house, more impact. So now it's going to be strat stratified um, in, a, in, a in a report that we have to, to produce um, and adopt. Um, house Bill 1181, that was a big, that's a big one. Uh, climate change, that's where you see that uh, climate change chapter being added to the GMA increasing housing supply. So yeah, I really amended the GMA goals um, and uh, you know, to the extent that housing um, income, all of these things are redefined a little bit um, and supply and density and variety of housing. It actually defines low income housing now, which we did not have that before. Next slide. Okay, so where do we start with all of this? Well, where we start is a public participation plan because um, we know that in this in this kickoff and uh, we, we started this discussion with the Planning Commission last night that um, the public participation and that continuous uh, encouragement of continuous and early involvement from our citizenry is extremely important and so we wanna make sure that the work that we're doing in this periodic update is really gonna reflect um, the input of, of this, the city and the people that live here. Uh, so that's one of the things that as we have drafted our public participation plan, and I will be uh, putting that in your packet, but I thought at this work, you know, work study, we could talk a little more at the end of end of these slides. What I, I'm I'm really, wanting to make sure that we go the extra mile. And I've taken to heart when I brought the sub area plan, public participation um, element to you. I mean, they, I, I mean, I keep ringing in my ears. Well, let's, you've got to get to the people you've got, if you want to get to the people and you don't want to just have, um, you know, these, these meetings and these surveys where we're, we're obviously not reaching as many people as I would like to reach. And I would be willing to bet you would like to reach as well. So, um, 
we're going to do a, a, a much more concerted effort in this um, in this program that we're doing is to go to city events, live city events, and have a, have staff there that uh, can talk to people and and give out information, educate, and receive input back. We're also looking at the potential, which was done with that 2015 of this kind of storefront idea. So that would be if I can find a willing uh, business owner downtown or maybe even two in different uh, convenient locations to put a, if, it would be like a fixed kiosk. They would be, no, but we, we wouldn't be staffing that. But, um, but at least to have information and, and things that if someone is walking by or walking in to get you know, something downtown, they might pick up a flyer and that's at least an entree into helping to reach another uh, person with what we're doing. Of course, the websites that we do webs with the website updates and keeping that information fresh on our website and thinks that we have a really nice, nice website now. Um, the stakeholder outreach, which we continue to do, and, um, and that's just working with our partners uh, as we go through this process, well, we maintain interested parties, you know, the email list. We'll be encouraging people to sign up on our website for notification because I think that's a really great tool. Um, then the Swally Tribe MOA, this is also a new legislative requirement, and I think it's a, I think it's a wonderful one. Uh, we will, uh, we are required to go to the Nisqually tribe and ask them if they would be willing to engage with the city through a uh, memoranda of agreement so that we're consistent and we're, um, we're, we're partnering with them. I mean, as you probably realize that the uh, tribes are uh, not state jurisdictions, so they're sovereign. So for a state jurisdiction required to plan under state guidelines, um, if we can then work with a sovereign nation um, to try to make sure that we're coordinating, that's that's a really great win. Uh, we're required to make the request, and so you know maybe they won't, maybe maybe it won't be received. Like maybe we don't want to do a real formal thing, but even if that doesn't go into a formal MOA that you see, um, at least we're going to be talking to each other, and that's very important. Planning commission meetings. That's a that's the traditional way to do our public participation, uh, the transparency, the regular meetings, the notice of these meetings, the materials we have in our planning commission um, multiple times for public comment and input. And we will um, continue to use that venue to the extent that it's, it's a solid, solid one. And, and people know that they can come in and talk to us or, you know, and get in front of the planning commission and as well as is the council. So you have all, um, you know, that's something that we, we, we recognize and encourage that people can come into council meetings when you're talking about it and having your workshops and particularly when you go to hearing. Next slide, please. So our, what is our approach? Uh, plan elements. So comprehensive plan is chapters that we also call elements. Um, and these, these, represent the different chapters that we have in our current comprehensive plan because time is so limited and we are, you know, we've got the sub area plan, which I'll talk about in a minute about how that's going to come together for you. We're going to do the minimum. We're going to do just what's mandatory in the citywide um, plan because uh, be simply because the staff and time capacity and all of that and, um, we know that we have to update the land use chapter, housing, transportation, parks and recs. So you can see the one, the economic development chapter. And again, with our work session tonight, I'm hoping that you weigh in on this approach because that's why I'm here to get, to get what you think about this. But the economic development chapter, we have, um, we really are thinking we don't have the capacity or the, uh, the time to update that. Um, and so we haven't we haven't identified that to do. It's not there's no mandated um, things that we need to fix there. Capital facilities, utilities, natural environment, and the last one that is um, very sad to me is uh, the historic and cultural preservation chapter. I really want to do that one. I think there's a high need, but there is no 
state uh, mandate to do anything to that. Um, and so I would uh, want to uh, see how you feel about docketing that to 2025 and not trying to do it this year. Next slide, please. So just the, the land use, I'm gonna try to run through this pretty quickly. Um, you know, what we're looking for in the land use chapter is of course the consistency with Puget Sound Regional Council, P Pierce County, the new legislation, you know, the updating projections, population projections, so the data, you know, basically updating the data. Um, we have to look at housing needs, land capacity. We're gonna be doing climate guidance. We're gonna bring throughout this, the whole comp plan. We're not required yet to do that climate chapter, but it, I think it would be, be a good idea for us to start talking climate early and putting some uh, goals and policies in sprinkling throughout the whole, um, throughout all these chapters. Open space corridors, green spaces. This is the one that is um, relatively new to look at how we connect our critical areas uh, with the tree canopy, with open space corridors and habitat. Low impact development or LID that had that came around a while ago, and I know that we um, we did some work but I'm very interested in doing more work where this is really a, a straight connection to our stormwater permit and how we manage stormwater runoff. Um, and in addition to just, you know, the green infrastructure approach as, as opposed to gray infrastructure that has more um, po pollution runoff. Um, environmental justice is something that again is new. Equity and environmental justice came across as a a really loud beacon and we will really it's it's missing uh it hadn't been discussed in pr previous you know the gma didn't really say much about it but this legislative uh, cycle we have uh, a, a lot of work to do going through an auditing and, and trying to make sure that not only that we're um, looking uh the environmental justice part and we're not creating any barriers or worsen, worsening any disparities that, that may exist in our land use plan. Um, and then that last one, I promise you, you wouldn't, you wouldn't lose sight of the WUI. So even though we heard from our building official that the WUI in the building code side of things is kind of like, you know, they're not sure what they're doing. The legislature said that we will have goals and policies to address the WUI. Next slide. Housing, housing's big. I keep saying housing is big. So preservation, improvement of what's existing. Um, moderate, this moderate density in middle housing um, is important. It's all about affordable housing. It's all about making sure that people from all income segments uh, have, actually basically the GMA now says housing is a right. And so we were looking through this in terms of uh, our housing goals and policies. Um, completing that inventory and analysis uh, by the income bans, um, and also looking at the capacity in our, you know, whether or not we have all the housing types, or we have looked at whether or not it's achievable uh, for government-assisted, low, very low, extremely low-income houses, housing manufactured. So as you can see, really, really specific. It's not general anymore. Emergency housing, shelters and permanent supportive housing. Those are all things we're gonna to have to think about. I haven't in my career thought about those and I've been through a lot of comprehensive plan updates. So this is new. It's gonna be, it's gonna be um, great. Next slide, housing again, more, more, more housing, uh, the barriers uh, for housing availability and you know, just the racial uh, disparity impacts, displacement, exclusionary goals and policies, anything like that, that, that we, um, we're gonna need to address, we're gonna wanna address them anyway. Um, but so now we're gonna be focused on, on that. Um, next slide. Capital facilities and utilities is another chapter, and it kind of goes without saying that we need to make sure that we're updating the inventories, those levels of service that, that I talked about, having a discussion about that, <clears throat> making sure that we are uh, looking at our capital budget decisions and that they are consistent with the goals and policies and implementing the vision. Um, so all, all of that, and we're... Um, 
you know, we're also required to look at green infrastructure, which that's new, but again, you're seeing more motion uh, in, in comprehensive land use planning and, and stormwater and environmental and climate change. Next slide. Transportation, that is the one that, um, that's, I would say the new piece there for us is multimodal, uh, looking at multimodal levels, which means like it sounds, we're not just planning a transportation network or looking at transportation improvements needed for cars. We're looking at it for all modes, bikes, pads, um, people with disability um, that may be in a, some kind of a, you know, another, I don't know if it's a wheelchair, whatever it is that they may be, but, uh, but it's not just cars anymore. Um, we are also required to uh, make sure that we have this transition plan uh, for Title II of the uh, uh, the ADA, American with Disabilities Act. So, and you can see the theme here running through here. It's all about ex not excluding people, making sure that we're making room and we're making budget and improvement decisions for everyone. Um, and so that also is in transportation. If we when we get through all of these and we identify what we need and we have to uh, look at the capital funding if, uh, in the ways that we are going to fund these improvements, if we funding falls short, we are, all, we are also required to uh, discuss how we're gonna raise the funds um, to meet what we will establish as level of service. We may or may not change that. We already have adopted level of service standards, but we'll be looking at those again. We'll be looking at those primarily um, because we focused on cars and the level of service standards for other modes of transportation. Next slide. Parks and Recreation, you'll be seeing the updated uh, Parks and Recreation, Parks, Recreation, Trails, and Open Space Plan. Um, so that work is, the thank goodness, that work is kind of already done, but what we will need to do is, is double check that it's consistent with this, with the comprehensive plan. It is actually... Um, in adopted and incorporated that park plan into uh, the comprehensive plan. Um, the one thing that Parks and Recreation wasn't focused on when they were working on this is the tree canopy coverage and that's sort of a new piece of legislation as well. Next slide, please. I, I don't think I'm gonna go through all of this, but there's a, there's a lot of other requirements. Like you said, climate change, there's tribal participation, the site unit of essential public facilities, I find fascinating. It's always been part of the GMA, but now it has been updated to um, include re-entry and rehabilitation facilities and regional transit facilities. These are now uh, defined as an essential public facility. So in, in the past, an, an essential pu public facility is something like a, um, a dump, right? You have to have a dump, but nobody wants the dump or a... Um, or a, um, 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 oh, what's the, not a, a prison. So prisons, you, you know, everyone, there needs to be prisons, but m lots of cities would be like, yeah, I don't want the prison here. So, but now we have new essential public facilities um, to make sure that we are, we don't have to, we don't have to provide capacity. We just have to make sure that we are coordinating within the region um, on those. General consistency, like I said, you've got to be consistent with county with all this um, uh, internally and externally. And um, future emergency amendments is another new one. So we need to set up procedure for adopting future emergency comprehensive plan amendments. So if we have to, um, let's say we have a goal or a policy or we have something that's adopted and an emergency arises, that is inconsistent with what we've adopted. We'll have a we'll have a, a back door to say this quickly can be done because otherwise your annual you're 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 only allowed under GMA to do once a year. Something may come up. It could be a budget emergency. Who knows? But now with this, we set up a procedure uh, to be able to have that emergency amendment. And then just the overview of the work plan. You know, we're gonna we've got this kickoff tonight. Um, putting out the public participation plan with the calendar of events and what we and dates about when we're going to be places and what we're specifically going to do to let the public know where they can, where hopefully we find them and they find us. Um, 
we're going to do what's called it. We have to do this gap analysis. So all those things that I've just talked about looking at in our current adopted plan, where there are gaps and specifically listing out what, what is it that we need to add or amend um, chapter by chapter. Engaging the community, uh, developing the draft plan chapters as we collect public feedback, um, taking it to the planning commission for their work sessions and their hearings, and then um, ending with a recommendation to you. And we hope, we don't hope, we'll have to have that. I mean, really our drop dead is to get all of this to you no later than October. Yeah. Not only that, but then you're, we're gonna marry in the sub area plan at the same time. So you will see uh, the sub area plan as a chapter of the comprehensive plan, a new, well, not a new, an updated chapter um, with all of these other updates coming to you in one package. There will also be some um, code amendments uh, to the DuPont Municipal Code in that package. However, in 2025, so six months after the adoption of the comprehensive plan, the legislature has given us a six month time frame to enact uh, and implement certain, uh, certain code amendments. So you'll see a few at the end of the year, you'll largely see the policy work. And then in uh, the first six months of 2025, you will be rolling through those regulations. Um, and, and as I said, I'd also like to pick up for our annual amendment in 2025, um, the historical and cultural element. 28 and 29, that's when we will be working out that whole. So if anybody asked you, what are you going to do about your climate change and resiliency chapter? Um, we've got it. We just don't have to do it this year. So it's not forgotten, but it's, it's there. On, it's in the, in the calendar for work. Next slide. So there you have it. Um, I'm just wondering if you might have any feedback for me on you know, your thoughts on achieving the maximum participation, uh, maybe your thoughts uh, or input for um, the approach, you know, really just to do the minimal because we don't have a lot of time. Um, and uh, any, anything that you saw and how I was uh, not only approached but priorities, um, I just would really appreciate any um, early uh, feedback that you may have tonight. Council Member Ballard. Well, that's a lot of work on your plate and the plate of the planning commission. So i um, kind of glad I'm not on the planning commission anymore, <laughs> actually. Um, now, having said that, um, Number one priority for me is always to push back against the uh, Commerce Department and that mislabeling of our high capacity transit designation for the city of DuPont. I want that to be continuous gadfly issue up there with AWC, with PSRC, with the PCRC. We don't need that designation. I'm going to be a hundred years old before a train comes here. Okay. Um, and that's not me. That's not hyperbole. That's on the plan. Okay. Um, second of all, the uh, climate uh, change and the climate uh, impacts that were stated throughout the, the, pl the, the plan, so to speak. Um, for me, science is empirical. Okay. It either is or it isn't. And uh, what we've seen recently with a number of different scientific things that have impacted our lives is that when science gets co-opted by big business, it becomes political. And that's what we're seeing happening here, specifically in this very progressive state. Okay. So when we talk about disparative impacts of climate on different populations, um, how are those disparate impacts uh, being recognized that will happen to the poorest of the poor when we're talking about eliminating fossil fuels and natural gas, when we're talking about the cost of transitioning to these green energy initiatives and the um, these energy costs having a disparative impact on these poor populations. So I'd like to see that addressed. 
as our approach to climate when we're talking about housing. Okay, not necessarily taking the big pill that's being given us and saying that, you know, CO2 is bad for the environment because, in fact, CO2 is necessary for the environment. And um, that's the, the second point I wanted to make. Um, the third point I wanted to make is that there are there's one issue on there that due to staffing and lack of time, we can't put any uh, supposed time into, and that's the economic development aspect. Um, you know, that plays right into the DuPont business community's sentiment that the city doesn't care about the economic development of its own, you know, existence. Okay. And I, you know, I'm not, that comment is not directed at anybody personally. That's just how it is. Okay. So rather than with us as a council saying that revenue generation is one of the most important things for us to focus this year, but yet we don't have time to spend on developing our small business community as it applies to our comprehensive plan. I think that perhaps uh, we had a SIG in the army, you know, never complain, always have a solution. Okay. And the solution here, I think, is reaching out to some people in that community and saying, hey, our staff doesn't have a lot of time, but what sort of things can you see that here's a previous thing that we've had in our comprehensive plan for the small business development? What do you see could help us to move us to the next step? And that way, that takes it off the staff. OK, and certainly we could they would probably welcome that input. And you ask for civilian and community input into the comprehensive plan. This is huge. Um, and. By the way, that last slide that said the future growth, the future work products. You said we had to put it on the back burner, but small business economic development was not included in 2025 or 2028. Okay, so thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Council member Basab. I guess Kevin covered the economic development <laughs> thoughts. Um, well, I can move on to the uh, participation like, um, so I know we were talking before last council meeting, but we can look at other, um, what other cities are, are doing or and what other, um, other organizations. So for example, um, Pierce County Library just recently finished a survey for their um, strategic plan. And uh, so one way we can, when we're meeting people where they're at, like at, a, at our um, upcoming summer events, uh, it's a combination of different communication styles. So I know we're going green, but making sure, you know, paper is still, you know, not just paper, but also, um, um, what is it called? QR codes, you know, something that when we're communicating with them, whether we're giving them something in their hand or, or on their phones at the moment so that they can take it back with them. And because sometimes if you're just communicating at the, at the time, then they're just going to forget about it. So it's just finding ways that, that people, you know, uh, register or, or receiving um, uh, the information um, and involving them. And also one thing I want to say is that, you know, assessing our uh, different demographics, um, and for example, age, you know, generational demographics, we don't talk about youth a lot. So involving youth, um, uh, their input, um, our senior population, because they're not gonna use, or at least, let me tread carefully with that. Um, uh, they may not use, you know, um, our online systems. So it's uh, so. There's a lot of ways we can uh, try to um, uh, reach out to people, um, the populations that we're not getting. And also, um, I know that uh, a city administrator is saying that he's uh, delving into our partnerships, reaching out, um, for example, to JBLM, um, the groups that are connected with our military uh, um, families, and uh, um, and just what Kevin is saying, our business communities. And that's still going, you know, that's still ongoing. Um, but yes, um, but yeah, we can talk more offline. Thank you. 
Deputy Mayor Winkler. First, uh, Barb, thanks uh, for the presentation. I know you had a real long meeting last night. You're here for another real long meeting. And thanks to you, your staff, and the Planning Commission. It's very clear they put a lot of care and concern in their meetings. They're very, very well informed. I, I do have a couple of concerns, and you don't have to try to give me an answer right now. Um, I understand because we had a chance to talk before why the updates come in all at once uh, versus what was originally planned. And you can only do one update a year. So we're, we're being presented uh, a huge sub area plan update and the old, in the entire comprehensive plan update all at once. I'm a little concerned about staff and uh, not staff, the council getting the opportunity to, to provide their concerns, their questions, their thoughts at the 11th hour in the process. Um, so if we can look at that timeline, and if even if it's just potentially a study session, once the planning commission and you and your team feel real good about the chapter that deals with the old Fort Lake, maybe you could bring that to us in August, September, um, and just say, hey, this is just one slice, but here's your opportunity for feedback. Um, you know, I'd be a little concerned about being offered the opportunity for feedback and input in November on something so big. I think of the time that it took in the council's input, collective and individual input on the state farm uh, deal. So I just wonder if you can bring that chapter earlier. And I know we won't be voting on it. I know it will come back, but at least you have our input at that point. Something to think about, okay? Um, the other thing I just wanted to share since our, um, as coming to the council so you know, at the 11th hour is what I'm going to be. And I realize everyone's working real hard. Roads, does that follow under transportation? Roads? Yes, yes. streets. Okay, yes. I'm going to just share one very broad term and no way do I want to, I, I want to allow the your planning commission, you to do your whole part. Uh, so when you're doing that part uh, across the board, uh, I just ask that when we're thinking about streets, we, you know, we think about the lessons learned from McNeil and the traffic concerns there and the idea of trying to put a school there right now. So wherever that school is sited, you know, and I know that was a big discussion last night and I'm not going to decide one way or another, but wherever it's, it's, you know, we design a traffic pattern that's put in right away that's, that goes by that building that, that doesn't bring traffic to a stop. For example, it may need to turn lane. So that's just something I'm gonna share up front. Uh, in any other traffic calming methods, you, you, at least you can say, well, I know what Mike's going to be concerned about. Traffic calming, not bringing traffic to a uh, complete stop in a school bond failing, all over concerns about traffic. Okay. And I'll leave it there. Thanks for all the hard work. Council Member Elliott. Well, I too appreciate all the work you've done. And that was quite a, and I'm really, that was quite a meeting last night. And I'm really impressed with the, the um, planning commission. They've asked some great questions and have really done their homework in advance. Um, but I'm, I'm with Mike. I am concerned about getting all this stuff at the last minute. So if we could, and it sounds like you're going to wrap up in May, uh, at least the old Fort Lake plan. So if we could get it sooner than later, um, I think it would help us a lot, and we could ask some different questions that may may impact the plan. I don't know, but um, if, if we could be presented with that opportunity, I, I would be grateful. Um, and then around um, two, two more things. I'm on the steering committee for the Pierce County Climate Conservation uh, Committee. And in June, we had a meeting today, and in June, our focus is all on, on uh, climate elements in comp plans because most cities in Pierce County are doing them now. And I think we're going to be having three consultants from, from different organizations come and talk about how they are incorporating those elements in their comp plans. So it, it could be a very useful, um, informative um, session that cities could really learn from. That's what we're hoping anyway. And then my last one is is ideas for public participation. And, and I think Mommy mentioned the library, if we could have, because we've got, that's a 
people love our library. Mm -hmm. And if people could, we could have information there, maybe a static display, um, uh, flyers that people could take with them. Um, and I was also wondering about the PTA meeting. I mean, we've got a lot of young families in town. Would would that be, I'm looking at you because yeah. you're our <laughs> liaison with the schools. <laughs> If we could do get something going with with the PTA before school gets out, um, and I like your idea about the park events being at the farmers markets and all those things, and the more we can do, the better it'll be. So, my hats off to you. You got a got a lot on your plate. Well, thank you. Any other comments from council? Okay, uh, I might have one question here that some of our uh, residents might bring up. I understand that uh, we have to accept ADUs, but uh, we have mostly small lots on DuPont. Some people have bigger lots, but um, if we have to accept an ADU, does that make the the property lines still relevant? Yeah, we you you can't deny an ADU as long as it fits within the property uh, lines and the setbacks. So you have a basic uh, parameter, you know, that the ADU can't exceed. So in other words, on these small lots, you know, depending on what the footprint of the, uh, the primary home is and those setbacks on that small lot, that's going to really um, be a, a factor in whether or not they could actually place a ADU there. Um, and if they could, what size would that be? Okay, So that could actually preclude an ADU in many of these lots, right? Potentially. Um, you know, I don't want to say that, you know, it just really depends if, um, I mean, it could be a really small ADU. <laughs> I mean, like, yeah, you've got 100,000 square house. feet. I don't know. But yeah. And and one other thing to uh, that we might even consider on our um, legislative priorities uh, issue that uh, Councilmember Ballard alluded to is that we have the climate change rules right, and we got the housing rules here, and these things are kind of fighting against each other. If we do the climate change things, that'll increase the price of these middle housing and all that sort of thing. So I think maybe the legislature needs to deal with that and figure out how that's gonna to work together. Um, I think they're fighting each other and uh, it might make a, uh, a, a difficult uh, transition for, for some of these things. Anyway, that's just a thought for our legislative priorities and we might talk to our legislators about. Uh, that's all I have there. I don't have under mayor's comments. Uh, well, thank you very much for your hard work. I think everyone can see that it's a monumental task that you have here. And uh, man, uh, I know you're going to be burning the candle at both ends here with with the planning commission and, and the other folks that are working with you. So thanks, Barb. We appreciate it. Yeah, I appreciate it. I and mean, really, you know, it, it is it is because we have such great planning commissioners. We have such great staff. We have such great support. Um, all working together and our partners as well. So it's a team. Okay, uh, we'll move on uh, under mayor's report and comments. I don't have anything further or anything for the council. Okay, uh, Deputy Mayor Winkler. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I only have one. <laughs> I know you declined the opportunity to have AWC come here and publicly uh, acknowledge you on your advanced certificate of municipal leadership. Um, I know your humble ways, but I think it was important for us to acknowledge that publicly and give you a round of applause on achieving that. Thank you. Councilmember Ballard. Thanks. Uh, this last week, the um, Housing Affordability Partners met. Um, we voted in a new member of our advisory board. This person has uh, lived experience in the um, low uh, low income uh, housing affordability housing space and is very active in the uh, South Puget Sound um, advising on these issues that these policies that we're looking at to develop more affordable and attainable housing. So that happened uh, 
last Friday. And then uh, this Friday, I will be attending a homelessness seminar. It's being hosted by Pierce County Regional Council um, represent or council member Hitchens. So, um, and the last thing I wanted to say is that uh, we lost a small business in our community. Uh, it was announced last week that the Ford Operating Base Brewing Company was closing its doors. And um, that business was more than just a place to go get a beer. Uh, that business was very much a part of our community, um, specifically a part of uh, the veteran community and the military community in that whenever they were asked to support a function uh, at their facility, rarely if ever did they uh, charge a fee for those that were being hosted by uh, what I would consider veteran service organizations, okay, nonprofits. Um, but they also were there for the um, American Legion during the barbecue donating uh, their products so that the American, I can't say donating because that's illegal. They were providing adult beverages at a, at a price so that the American Legion might be able to uh, provide adult beverages at the um, event. Um, additionally, I can't tell you how many times a uh, conversation started there amongst veterans that had no other place to really open up about important things that were going on in their lives or whether they just wanted to reminisce. Um, to the Wharton family that brought their entrepreneurial spirit here and actually put it out there for this community, I want to thank you on behalf of a very grateful citizen of DuPont um, and your, um, your presence in that entity will be lost uh, and, and will be heartbroken over it. Uh, I also wish to mention that the, fam the Wharton family are some of the newest residents of DuPont. They moved here recently. Um, and so if you see them around town uh, and you recognize Jared or Jennifer or Chanel or any of their family, please thank them for what they brought here during their time uh, running that business. Thank you. Council Member Wargo. I just wanted to say that it's opening day for baseball and softball here in uh, the city of DuPont. And I invite everybody to come out and watch uh, that. But most importantly, probably first is the uh, the first pitch from the mayor. So we're, gonna, we're looking <laughs> forward to a curveball up there. So, And I, I just have to mention, Barb, uh, Amy Walker got us out of a, out of a um, pretty um, sticky situation with the school district and uh, so her efforts have just been been outstanding. I guess I can put it on C-click fix, but I'm going to do it here nationally. So thank you. Council Member Bassam. Why haven't we mentioned congratulations on retirement? Uh, Council Member Wargo is retired from the National Guard. Oh, right. <laughs> yes. yes. Council Member Elliott. I just want to give a shout out to Chris Fletcher, who's on our Parks Commission. Um, he leads uh, every Monday. He leads a walk for citizens. Anybody can sign up and they all pick up trash as they're out walking. And so it's a really nice thing that he's doing. And he's also doing bike tours, too. So you can find him on Facebook um, and he does have a little email list going, too. But thank you, Chris. Okay, I don't see any other council comments, so now it's time for our city administrator's report. Keith, do you have anything for us tonight? Yeah, thank you, Mayor. I do have a few things tonight. First of all, I want to just give a special uh, thanks and, and appreciation for the staff for their hard work on the presentation tonight for the new website. I've, I've done those in the past. I know the time and energy behind the scenes that goes into that. Really appreciate their hard work and excited to, to roll that out and for the community to see it and excited to present that tonight. So just thank you to all of them for all their work. I know I know what that takes, so appreciate you. Um, some good news for the city. The Home Course is hosting the 2024 Washington Junior Golf Association State Championships. So what a wonderful event for our community, which will be held August 6th through 8th. So excited for that event to come here. I uh, just wanted to know a couple things happening. The public input for P Chief Leshai Park is this Saturday, April 13th from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. 
at the DuPont Powder Works Park, which is at 1775 Bob Hollow Lane. So please come and give your input on that. We have a senior activity. We have a lunch at the landing, uh, which is in partnership with the Patriot Landing, which is Friday, April 19th. Doors open at 1130. Meals at noon. Uh, cost is $12. Finally, I guess as a history buff, I can't help but acknowledge today is the 159th anniversary of the surrender of <laughs> the Army of, of, of of the uh, Northern Virginia General Lee to the General in Chief of the U.S. Army, future President Ulysses S. Grant. Um, I, I do think one of the things that strikes me about that is is also one of the great coincidences in history, which is a gentleman named Wilmer McLean who owned Appomattox Courthouse. The surrender was done in his parlor. Mr. McLean actually initially owned property near Manassas, Virginia, where the First Battle of Bull Run. So the first significant uh, interactions between the two armies, first battle between the two armies occurred in his front yard and ended in his parlor. Uh, what's also great is Mr. Wilmer sold his property, or, or Mr. McLean sold his property wanting to get away from the war. So he was unsuccessful in that endeavor, but uh, nevertheless, want to give a, a acknowledgement to I think one of the great coincidences in history. And with that, Mr. Mayor, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Any questions for our city administrator? Okay. Well, we've had our history lesson. It is now uh, 8.32, and I will adjourn the meeting. Thank you, everyone.